After 12 years of being a home brewer, I'm working towards opening my own brewery, Sapwood Cellars in Columbia, Maryland. We'll be focusing on hoppy beers and sour beers. For the hoppy beers though, which will be the majority of our clean beer production, we don't just want to produce IPAs. We want to do a range of beers that appeal to a range of palates. So for this batch, I want to investigate brewing a sort of gateway entry level hoppy beer. Something for people who don't like the harsh bitterness, big grassy flavors that you can often get in IPAs, even in New England IPAs. So I turned to a version of American Pale Weed Ale, heavily uh, dependent on weight boil additions of Citra and Amarillo, a little bit of surprising yeast character, and rather than wheat, chit malt and golden naked oats. So let's get going with the process. Rather than dilute my water with distilled like I usually would, I opted for 100% Washington DC tap water. The goal was to better replicate the water we'll be dealing with at the brewery. For the grain bill, mostly Pilsner, a little bit of American two row, but the real signature malt was the golden naked oats. These are sort of like a light crystal malt. Um, they have a nice slick mouthfeel addition and they give it, uh, some people call it a berry flavor. They're really great in hoppy beers. I went for a relatively high 158 degree Fahrenheit mash temperature. The goal here was to make sure that the blend of yeast I'm using didn't dry out the beer too much. While a high mash temperature does create more dextrins, there have been a couple studies suggesting that dextrins themselves don't have a huge impact on mouthfeel. What a high mash temperature does do is allow you to use more malt per gallon of beer without letting the alcohol get too high. In this case, to make sure I maintain that mash temperature with the cold air outside and the beer was circulating through the pump, I left the heat on low, just barely on, to make sure that it didn't scorch the wort on the bottom, but that I didn't lose too much temperature either. I find sticking my mash paddle down into the grain bed is the best way to figure out if my recirculation speed is correct. Compacted means I'm going too fast. For the mash pH, it took both the calcium chloride and the calcium sulfate all in the mash, plus a couple of teaspoons of lactic acid to get down to target. I'm usually not in a big hurry for the runoff either. With two burners, I can heat the boil while I'm still sending word over. So a nice slow pace ensures that I get almost all the sugar that I can out of there. With all the word over, I started the boil. This was a pretty uneventful one. I didn't add any hops to the boil, and in fact, I didn't even add any hops right at flame out. To make sure that I didn't get an excessive amount of bitterness from those flame out hops, again, targeting people who like low bitterness, I chilled the wort to 185 degrees Fahrenheit, which is still within the isomerization range, but not that far into it. To make sure it didn't drop any further though, I left a very low flame on to maintain that temperature. After the Citra and Amarillo had given their all, I removed them and set about chilling. The goal here was to get down to about 60 Fahrenheit, cool enough that the Belgian and uh, Hefeweizen strains that I was gonna add wouldn't get too fruity, too weird to overtake all the rest of the characters of the beer. For yeast, I went with a blend of three dried strains. These three were supposedly found in a can of an IPA from Treehouse Brewing. I went with a combination of 11 grams of SO4, that's dried English ale yeast, one gram each of T58, which is Belgian ale, and WB06, which is a Hefeweizen strain. The idea is that you're not going to taste those obvious esters. It's not gonna be banana-y or bubblegummy, but when you have those fruity hops, having some yeast character behind them is just going to be a backup note. It's going to enhance the fruitiness of the beer without making it obviously a Hefeweizen or a Belgian ale. It's an interesting concept, and it might also give the beer a little bit more legs. Uh, as those hops fade out a little bit, you'll still have some of those esters behind it keeping up. For fermentation, I went for about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, just trying to keep those esters, again, in the background, not too big, not too bold. The same thing I do for a hoppy Hefeweizen or, a, say, a hoppy wit beer. The experimental portion of this batch was that one fermenter got the dry hops, two ounces of citra and one ounce of Amarillo, 
on brew day at the same time as the yeast. The idea here is that fermentation drives off some of those brighter, more aggressive hop aromas, and that having the hops present during the growth phase is ideal for producing those bioconversions, biotransformations that everyone is so excited about. For the other half of the beer, though, I wanted to go with a more traditional route, so I waited until day four and then add the exact same dosing of hops. One of the great things about brewing 10 gallon batches is that I get to try these things out without a whole lot of extra hassle and still have enough to fill two kegs. With fermentation complete, it was time to move on to kegging. The last time I tried to fill through the liquid outpost, the little bits of hops that hadn't flocculated out all the way ended up clogging the poppet. The solution to this was to get a bouncer filter. This is just a little filter that has a little mesh. To purge it with oxygen, because I didn't want to oxidize the beer, I pressurized the keg and then I hooked it up so that it would blow CO2 out. Putting the end under the water prevented any oxygen from getting back in. Luckily, it worked perfectly. Um, no clogs. It picked up probably a tablespoon of um, larger hop debris. It's not going to make your beer crystal clear. It really is just to grab those larger chunks that would cause problems, either clogging a poppet, clogging a tap, something like that. As you can see, the little rotating racking arm on the SS brew bucket does a pretty good job of getting almost all the beer out of there. I still wish they were a little bit bigger than seven gallons. Eight would have been perfect. First up, I'm pouring the one that was dry hopped on brew day. I know, I know, a little bit clearer than it's supposed to be. And this is the one that was dry hopped on day four. Looks pretty similar, actually. So the question is, does a little bit of process timing when you add the dry hops actually make a noticeable difference in the flavor profile? So this beer is the half that was dry hopped on brew day. You can call it brew day dry hop, you can call it day zero dry hop, you can call it a cold flame out hop. During the growth phase of yeast is when you get most of those interesting yeast hop interactions. And so I thought it'd be interesting to see if this was a technique that really did push those flavors in a way that flame out hops didn't. On the other hand, a more traditionally dry hopped beer on day four. Fermentation, as you probably saw, was nearly complete. Um, still a little bit of CO2 off gassing, but probably just the yeast close, cleaning things up a little bit. Um, a little hazier, I'd say, um, but otherwise a very similar uh, beer in terms of appearance. Mm. Much brighter, greener hop aroma and flavor sort of saturated through on this one. The Brew Day Dry Hop, it's a good beer. It's bright, it's citrusy, but it's not as obviously hoppy. Um, and for a batch like this, that's actually what I'm looking for. I was hoping for a beer that wouldn't be as immediately identifiable as an IPA. So many people don't like IPAs because they're too bitter or they're too grassy or they're too green. Uh, and Ang the Hops on Brew Day really sort of drives off some of those greener, grassier aromatics, leaving just sort of that baseline fruitiness. Um, it also allows the yeast character to poke through a little bit more, that tiny percentage of hefeweizen yeast is actually a little bit more expressive, just a little bit of banana. Um, I don't get bubble gum or anything like that from the Belgian strain, but certainly has a, a deeper yeastier flavor compared to the day four dry hop, which has a, a more traditional IPA kind of saturated, um, that citra gives it a great almost melony hop flavor. They're both good beers. Um, the difference is not gigantic, I have to say that. Uh, the difference between uh, day zero and day four, uh, certainly this tastes a little bit hoppier, but I'm not sure in a blind taste if I'd be able to say what the difference was. Mm. This is more on target though with what I was hoping for this batch, a hoppy beer for uh, an Allagash white drinker for someone who likes 
you know, orange juice or, or lemonade or something like that without the acidity though. Um, in both cases, the bitterness is low. They've got a little bit of toastiness from the golden naked oats. Nice lacing, although head retention isn't spectacular for either of them. Overall though, an interesting beer. Um, I think honestly that Brude Dry Hop, the best application is if you want to add some of those flavors typically associated with a flame out hop. But since it's cold, you're not gonna keep extracting bitterness. You won't be isomerizing those alpha acids and you'll end up with a beer which has lower bitterness, but with those uh, flavors more associated with those yeast hop interactions. Well, I'm gonna keep playing with the combination, with the flavors, with the process, but I think there's something to be said for this technique. It's not gonna completely revolutionize the way that IPAs are brewed, but it's gonna change the way I brew this beer. And sometimes that's all you can ask for. Hmm. See you next time.